Hello, listeners, and welcome to the Downright Upright Show, the place to go to hear out loud and proud what Minnesotans are thinking. And I am your host, Philip Anthony. I'm so glad that you could join us today. I hope you're all doing fantabulous, and fantabulous is my word for fantastic and fabulous put together. It's twice as nice. Okay. (laughs) It's my little quirky thing. My special guest today is LGBTQ plus advocate, writer, and author of the book Getting to Ellen, a memoir about love, honesty, and gender change, and the radio host of the AM 950 talk show Ellie 2.0. Radio Ellie Krug. Welcome, Ellie, to the Downright Upright Show. I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for this having is me. It's an amazing, amazing honor to have you. I, I am a big fan, and uh, I am a little nervous. So. Don't be nervous. It's okay. all all right. <laughs> okay. So before we begin, I identify as gay, and my pronouns are he and him. And would you like to share you, uh, how you identify on the LGBTQ plus spectrum? Yeah, well, I, I, even though I'm trans, I identify as female, and she and her pronouns. Okay, good. Thank you for that. Uh, before we talk about your fascinating career, um, would you like to tell the audience a little bit about your beginnings, like the early part of your life's journey? So, exam- for example, I know that you came from Newark, and I was born in Brooklyn. So can you talk about those early days for yeah, us? Yeah, we got this East Coast thing going on. Yeah, we got a connection. You got your, con- you got your accent, and if people listen carefully, they'll hear mine. Do you um, say talk and walk and coffee? I say wash. I'm going to go wash the car. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, um, yeah, I did grow up in New Jersey, and um, – and when I was 11, my uh, my family, uh, my father was relocated by his company to Cedar Rapids, and so for you know for me growing up, and I was and I grew up in a in a lower blue collar neighborhood in New Jersey in Sayreville, home of John Bon Jovi, I might note. And um, oh, okay, <laughs> uh, and I went. We moved to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and overnight transported to upper middle income. Um, Brand new house, my own bedroom. It was just something else. Okay. But it was a different world, okay? And so I went from a neighborhood where probably the aspiration was the military or trade school to a neighborhood where, of course, you're going to college, you know, kind of thing. Um, So, you know, and and along the way, uh, I developed an incredibly good work ethic such that when I was – a senior in high school, I was working 40 hours a week and getting some work study for it, of course, um, but uh, hardly going to class, but I still graduated, you know. We all did that, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, but that was in the days, um, yeah, yeah. Philip, when you could actually save money and pay for college. Oh, well, true. Yeah. You know, and so, I mean, even at a $2.50 a cent job, I was able to save enough money to pay for a year and a half of college. So, yeah, yeah so there's that. Was beginnings. the transition for you to Iowa difficult, or were you too young to even realize? No, that? it was difficult. It really was. It was a diff- just a way different place. So um, going from a, uh, the city life to more, um, I guess, the country mouse to the city yeah, mouse. Well, I mean, you know, you could see cornfields from my bedroom window in Cedar Rapids. So you know, we didn't have that where I lived in New Jersey. Um, so um, <laughs> let's go into your life's journey here. Um, because you have a very interesting life's journey. I mean, our listeners will find this out. Can you tell the listeners about your life's journey from your early years through your gender journey and into your LGBTQ plus experience? So that whole process, how is that? Because I know I, yeah. mine was very difficult. And I'm sure yours was just because we're from a di- this similar de- generation. So it must have been hard for you just like it was for me. Well, you know, I mean, throw in top of it that I was living in you know, Iowa, um, right. very conservative, religious kind of place, but not nearly as bad as it is right now. Um, oh, true, yeah. Um, you know, uh, you know. so I'm growing up before Stonewall, and then Stonewall occurs. Yes. Um, um, but I started having, you know, gender issues. I mean, I, I was something was going on with me, you know, as – an adolescent, young adolescent, but really when I was 11 years old is really the time that it all sort of cemented. Um, and I'm not very proud of it, but, you know, one day I went into my sister's bedroom when no one was home, trust me, and mm-hmm. opened uh, the drawer to her underwear drawer and and um, 
and uh, stripped off my boy clothes and put on the prettiest pair of panties and camisole with little yellow flowers. I still remember them. And uh, standing in front of the mirror from sideways to the back, um, I looked like a girl, and I just remember the electricity that went through my body. Um, I had thought for a long time, a very long time, that this was just a phase, something I would grow out of. Um, you know, in 1969, early 70s, the idea that your brain didn't match your body and that you could do anything about it. I mean, it was like, are you kidding? What are you talking about? You know, and so I really did think it would go away. I happened to have the good luck of, of and, and I was a jock. I mean, nobody had any idea that my gender identity uh, as it was forming was not consistent with my gen, out, outward appearance. And I got I got very lucky and fell in love with a girl when I was in high school. I was a freshman. She was a senior, or a sophomore, and she turned out to be my soulmate. And and I tried to tell her about what was going on in my head around gender, and she freaked out. Um, and I learned at that moment two important things about life. First, I learned that if I ever let anybody know what was going on in my head, that I would lose them. Yeah. Anybody who's LGBTQ right now knows exactly what I just said. And uh, the second thing I learned was that I was going to be a pretty good trial lawyer because in that conversation, I changed the subject and she went for it. <laughs> I was a paralegal, actually, before I was a flight attendant. Oh, my goodness. Good so for we're, you. We're, we're marching down the same road, we, we I are. think. We are. Well, do you like panties with little yellow flowers well, on them? Well, I have a similar st <laughs> story, though. But I, I, I was around the time of I Am Woman, Hear Me Roar. You know, oh, Helen, God, Helen, Helen Reddy. Reddy you know? <laughs> and I remember this like it was yesterday. One day, my mom had a wig. She only had it because like sometimes she would go out and she wanted to look fancy. Yeah, so, yeah. She put, so I put this wig on and I took a brush and I played the record <laughs> and I was in the mirror singing this and she caught me. And I knew I wasn't supposed to do that. <laughs> oh, but, no. An early dash to your drag, <laughs> your drag career. <laughs> My drag days, you know. But the thing was about it was that um, – I um, it wasn't that I didn't like my body, you know, because I know what the trans experience is, but the gay experience is. I wanted to be the girl that every every boy wanted. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's so uh, it was so weird to me, and I knew I was different from that time. But my mother always said to me, "Don't do that again. Boys are going to make fun of you, and it's not right." And mm -hmm. so I kept it suppressed after that day. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, it's it it was well, and then, of course I went through all the. Uh, you know, making fun of and being treated like, you know, horribly and, yeah. Well, I was able to hide pretty well. So, I mean, um, and I suppressed. Um, but, you know, I was a jock. I and, wasn't. Yep. Yeah, nope. I was a jock and, and um, you know, had short hair, well, long hair and then short hair. But, I mean, nobody would – nobody ever – when I eventually came out at age 52, I mean, people were shocked because they had no idea. Were you popular in school too? Yeah. I would, you know, I hung out with the popular guys. Yeah. Oh, oh really? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. See, I was not. Part I of, was nope. the one, the kid that they beat the hell out of, you know? Well. Because I was Brooklyn. It's very, you know, macho, you know, Guido's are living there. And um, I didn't, I just didn't fit. You well, know? I mean, I, I certainly was bullied in, in uh, high school, but. I think that they were bullying me. Maybe, I don't know, maybe they picked something up. But, I mean, I think that they were just bullying me because they just thought they could do it. And they did. They did do it. Um, but, um, but, but you had a sharp tongue to get them back, though, right? Uh, you know, it was just some endurance. So I learned a, li a lot about enduring things. Yeah, I, okay. I, I shut up. I let them say whatever yeah. they wanted because I was too afraid, you know? Yeah. No, no. I mean, no. But, I mean, my experience with being bullied is far less than for, you know, many, many, many <clears throat> people. But yes, I was popular. I'm still, I became best friends with the eighth grade quarterback. I was the front line guard in, on the eighth grade football team. And okay. he and I are still best friends. Still very, nice. very best friends. He's like my brother. I, we talk several times a week on the phone. That and is so nice. I just went out, drove out to Utah to over Christmas to see him. So you know, it's funny. I, I was just talking about. I'm going off on the tangerine here a little bit, but um, uh, allies, okay, uh, LGBTQ plus allies are so so important. In the, mm -hmm. You know, because we keep thinking about each other, but if we didn't have those allies to help us out and to back us up and support us, 
right? I mean, you have this yeah. this this uh, um, quarterback. You said he was. Mm-hmm. Um, he's probably like you know this big guy. You know, and uh, yeah, no, uh, he's you know he's a hunter. You know, he he likes to go out and hunt and kill things, and and yeah. no, you would think that the two of us would not be best friends, but, but that's what I'm saying. But yeah. he's got a soft heart, and Good for him. you know, and and he and I together have been through some things, and and uh, no, he he just never left me, and my brother never left me, my brother Mark. Um, you know, I told Mark uh, that, you know, I really was a chick and not a dude, and I, you know, a couple of years before I even came out um, to the world. And he was pronoun proper when we were, you know, private, and, and he was calling me sis right away. I mean, my brother just unbelievable. And, and Thap, I'm my, that's my best friend. His last name is Tharp, but I kind of, you know, murdered it. And so his, <laughs> his nickname is Thap, T-H-A-P. Okay. Um, and I write about him in my book. Of, I write about both my brother and, and Thap in my book. But, you know, he he never hesitated. He just never – he didn't care. I came out first as gay because I thought maybe I was just a gay man with a panty fetish. That didn't work. Um, quickly, I understood that I was really not a gay man. Um, mm-hmm. But he didn't care about that, you know. And then when I shifted and said, well, I really – I think, you know, I'm a chick. He's like, I don't care. You know, and uh, really not. And he just never, ever wavered. And he'll still still trip up on the pronouns every once in a while. Um, And I'm like, Thap, after all these years, he's still doing that, you know. Um, But uh, the love is there, though. Oh, my God. Are you kidding me? No. The love is incredible. If you can think about the quarterback and the frontline guard 52 years later saying, I love you. Um, when we end oh. our phone calls, I mean, if you can, oh, you know, if you that's can, beautiful. If you, yeah, I mean, you know, it's plutonic. I mean, he's married and he's got kids and, you know, I mean, I would never date that guy. He's too controlling, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> and he knows, that. Oh, he knows, goodness. he knows how I feel. So, <laughs> right, right. but, uh, no, I, you know, you're right about allies. And I think that our, uh, certainly our younger people who are in many ways much luckier because it's a far more accepting society. That's a very broad statement because in a lot of places it's not accepting. A lot of families are not, are rejecting and not accepting. I I understand that. But I think that our younger people still need allies just like everybody else. Um, It may be a little bit easier for them to find them, but I don't know. And, and, uh, you know, I talk to a lot, to, a lot to, I work a lot with younger LGBTQ plus people and, um, you know, they have some of the same challenges that I had growing up and, you know, I mean, that also fuels why I want to help them. Yeah. And I, and I, <clears throat> my last podcast, I was uh, interviewing, um, JP, uh, Der Bogohosian mm-hmm. and, um, he, um, we were talking about how today there are schools where you can go to a safe place, for example, for an LGBT club. Yeah, yeah. You know, like a high school. Yeah, GSA, Gay Straight Alliance or Gender but, Sexuality Alliance. Yep. Exactly. That's who I, I go and speak to those. And that shocks me to, to, to the – because I, yeah. I would never have imagined that growing up in my, in my day. Because, right. you know, like I said, I'm 62 years old. I grew up in, with a lot of um, and, you know, homophobia yeah. and you know, being gay was like – they'd just beat you up. You were worthless. Yeah. You, know? well, you and I both grew up when the word queer was a, a weapon. It was a weapon, you know. Yes. But today, mm-hmm. it's an identity. I mean, our younger people are like, "Hey, just call me queer," and I think it's wonderful. You but know, the F I mean, the F A word was my worst word. Yeah, well, and that's still a slur. and it's still a slur. Yeah, that's and, still a slur. Um, I'm I'm not. That word gives me. You know, I I, yeah. I, I go, crawl into a ball. You know, I can't <clears throat> handle that word. Still to this day, yeah, when no. I hear it, yep. Uh, um, it makes me sad, and it makes me feel uh, diminished as yeah. a person, you know, because I feel like, you know, I, I, I'm actually in the best place I've ever been in my life, oh. and, and, and so have you. So are you. I'm sorry. And I have a husband that loves me, and I'm, you know, in a really good place. But I finally grew into my skin because it was hard growing up like that, you know, and coming yeah. here to Minnesota, and I have to say this, I keep being a cheerleader for Minnesota, but I came here and I've got nothing but support since I've been in this state. I just love it. Well, you know, it's interesting. You know, I do a lot of speaking, and I was at uh, Wazetta Community Church mm-hmm. on uh, Wednesday night 
speaking about um, the injustice that the LGBTQ community, but particularly trans young trans humans are facing. And um, one of the part of the discussion was about how special Minnesota is. I mean, you know, I, mm-hmm. I told the, the audience on Wednesday night that what's happening is we're creating this ocean of red um, with oases of blue, islands of blue. And, you know, in the upper Midwest, <clears throat> the, the island is Minnesota. Um, you go a little bit east, um, you, you got Illinois as an island. And then after that, you know, we've got to go all the way to Jersey. <laughs> really? <laughs> Jersey, okay. You know, you New know, York. Or New York, yeah. upstate New York. I mean, but... California. Well, that's the other direction. You know, <laughs> well, between us and California is Colorado. Uh-huh. Okay, yep. but then we're on... But after that, we're on the, you know, on the West Coast. And, and as I said on Wednesday night, that those who are marginalizing our community and other communities, because they're also marginalizing people of color people who are born in places outside the U.S., they're marginalizing, that they're just so short-sighted because the, our younger people, even if they're not LGBTQ, they want to be in a place where diversity and inclusion are core values. They want to live in neighborhoods where it's different, where it's not all the same people. Right and so, here. I love that. You so know. what's going to happen and what's happening, I believe, is that the, the Blue Islands are going to benefit, you know, we're going to get an influx of people who are going to happen to be the smartest and the brightest who are going to come and want to be here and plant their roots because they know they're going to, they are protected or the people they love are protected. Mm-hmm. It is so short-sighted by, um, you know, those who would seek to marginalize us and pass these, I mean, don't, you know, you can get me started. I mean, you, you, we literally have dozens of state actors, you know, of, of official governmental machinery um, directed against a group of humans, you know, LGBTQ+, plus, but particularly trans young humans, passing laws, I mean, laws to take away your right to play sports, your right to use the facility of, that aligns with your gender identity, your right to medical care. We have states passing laws saying, no, y- young transgender humans, you can't do any of that. <coughs> Florida. Oh, you know, That's a and, joke down well, there. It's and, a joke. But, but it is um, – but nobody is yelling about it. Mm. You know, it's um, – Because the, – It's it, appalling. Again, it, it, we go back, it goes back to the ally thing. You know, when you can see as a person – that that group is being discriminated against or mistreated in any way, you can either go, you know, help the person out and understand that their humanity, or you can say, well, that's an other, yep. an other them, you know, like African Americans, the same thing, you know, they in Florida, I mean, AP AP African American history is now being questioned as a as a subject in schools, in high school, and to me, why just them? You know what? What that's overt racism. If you yeah. if you ask me, no, it's it's, it's right. awful. No, it it is, and um, and while it may uh, garner some votes today, um, I think it's just tremendously short sighted, and um, I don't know. I mean, but for my community, for trans young, particularly young trans people, um, it it is uh, it. You know, I mean, I don't want to use the word genocide because that is just too strong because mm-hmm. I don't want false equivalencies. But, I mean, it is targeted discrimination causing a whole entire community to feel as if they are lesser in our society. No, exactly. And that has tremendous ramifications. Yes. It's, it's <clears throat> again, othering Yep. It's this is, and I was speaking about this on a pr- previous podcast. I was talking about the the <coughs> uh, Republican way of getting butts to the polls. I think they use this as a way to motivate their voters. I oh, mean, it's, yeah, it's no sad it. to think about that. Why would hate 
bring people to the polls, but it's working for them. Yeah, you know? love is not as much of a motivating factor as anymore. As, yeah, as hatred is. Willie Horton ads. Remember during yeah. the '80s and '90s when yeah. uh, they just show a black face and he killed somebody, and then they, all of these. Dukakis, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of that still happening in 2023. And yeah. um, and that's why I say marginalized people have to look at each other and say, if we don't have each other's back, they're gonna, first they're going to come for you, then they'll come for me, and then everybody else right after that. So um, I, I think that's where that coalition <clears throat> comes in. You know, I think that's why the Democrats seem to be doing a lot better, I think. Uh, uh, electorally, I'm I'm speaking about because I think um, they see well, they're coming after this person, they're coming after that person, and everybody's coalescing into a, like, no, I'm not taking this, I'm not. I mean, look at women, you know, yeah. or, 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 or a child bearing humans, as you as you referred to them. I mean, they um, they only states that they can have their reproductive freedom and health care is in blue states. They don't have the same freedoms as people in red nope, states. Nope, and you know, and it's. I mean, no, it's it's um, it's it's pretty unbelievable. It really is, and this is why I do my work. You know, where my work should be is in all of those red states. I'd love to get invited to go and speak in those red states. I really would, mm -hmm. um, because I I just got done uh, doing a podcast with uh, Stephanie Glaros from. Uh, uh, one small step, take take a small step, which is a, a story core initiative about getting people of one person and another person who have opposing views to sit down and talk to each other. And as she related, and as I believe even before hearing from her, that once we can just understand that we have things in common, that we're all human, we're all attempting to survive the human condition, yes. we're not going to grab everybody, but we will grab far, far, far more people than what we ordinarily would by just being in our respective camps, lobbying, you know, yeah. things at each other. So I, I would love to interview <clears throat> someone that has different views than I do. You know, I think it would um, – because I don't, I don't believe in getting vile and and, yeah. and mean, and I just think if you talk about the issues and just say, "Look, I'm a you see me, I'm a person. Right. I'm not. I don't want your children. I don't want <clears throat> to take over your your state or or your your beliefs. Or all I want to do is live in peace. Right. If you want to live, you know, under your whatever religion you happen to be, that's. I, I don't have a problem with your with you that way. So why did, why can't we just see each other eye to eye and Work it out as two human beings. No, nope. and and you, you know, know, so maybe you've got some listeners who know somebody that might be willing to come and be on your show. You know, yeah, maybe so. you can help me out if you know anybody. <laughs> well, I'm going to grab them before you, so just so you know, <laughs> yeah, you could have them. Yeah, <coughs> okay. Um, so let's move on to um, now. I've listened to your show quite a few times, and I discovered you're very proud of your work as an idealist. Mm -hmm. I love that word. Thanks. And uh, would you explain in your own words to the listeners what that word means to you? So, sure. So, Ellie 2.0 Radio, the show that you're speaking of, mm -hmm. is about idealism and idealists. People working – an idealist, in my view, is someone working to try and make the world better. You know, but yeah, I mean, you got to work for it. It's not like in your head, I want it to be better, you know, and it's not something you fit in between yoga and take out sushi. It's <laughs> really something that you have to work up, work on every day. And, yes. you know, and I was, um, and you're not too far away from me, but you may not have been doing this uh, at the time. I mean, I started reading the newspaper when I was seven um, in Jersey. And even though my family was on the lower end of things, um, they still got two newspapers. In the morning, it was the Daily News, and in the evening, it was the Star Ledger. I read the Daily News, and <laughs> um, and you know, at first it was the comics, but eventually I migrated towards you know the big stories and the opinion page. And so by the time, and Dr. King and Bobby Kennedy were both in the news quite a bit. I mean, they were all over the place. They were on TV, and um, and before they went. And I don't know how because my family was not political. My family was not involved. My family was, it wasn't a family of volunteers, wasn't a family of we're going to go support the nonprofit downtown and, or you know, across town and do the, um, the meals. And, um, but somehow their words, Dr. King's and Bobby's words, sank into me. They did. And they caused me to 
believe that I have an obligation to make the world better. And so I, you know, when they were murdered um, when I was 11 in June, in April and June of 68, um, by then I, you know, I had already thought I was going to be a lawyer. And I first wanted to be an environmental lawyer to go and change the world and, and protect the environment because I went through the very first Earth Day. I was in yeah, seventh I remember grade. those. Yeah. <laughs> the very first one. And... Um, and so, um, and so that's why I went to law school to become an environmental lawyer. Um, it did not work out that way because I did some uh, um, suppressing of my gender identity, and it's hard to you know have part of you that's authentic, which is my idealism, show up, but not all of you. So um, all of that got put on hold till I uh, transitioned genders, and then in fifty two, at age fifty two in twenty oh nine, when. I transitioned. I could have. I lost my law firm. I could have rebuilt it, but I didn't want to. And instead, I wanted to go and be a idealist. And so I've been doing that. I've been do- doing an idealistic work, trying to change the world since um, 2009. That's beautiful. You're, you're, you're a beautiful soul. I mean, if you oh, when you think of of all the things you could have done, because like you said, you were interested in environment, and you went into idealism, which is yeah. In yeah. itself, uh, imagine if everybody thought that way, what kind of a change the world mm. would be, you know. Um, so what do you think of the hurdles uh, – what do you think the hurdles are in today's society for younger people discovering their authentic gender? And how would you compare that to discovering one's true self later in life as you did? So in other words, you came – into yourself later in life. Now there are kids today that are really young and they're discovering themselves earlier. Uh, what do you, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I think that, I mean, for our younger people, the, the reason that we're seeing more and more young LGBTQ people is not because straight boys just see two men kiss and they think, well, I'm going to try and do that. Um, <laughs> it's simply because our younger people are seeing more humans living as who they truly are. And they, they're getting braver earlier. Um, and so we're just seeing more and more of that. And, and you know, you, they're being supported. Um, now, now, this is all ge- geography, you know, based. I mean, in the rural areas, it's far more of a challenge to come out and be who you are. I'll say, yeah. <clears throat> um, so, I, you know, I, so I think that it's just you see people living authentically and you're like, well, I'm going to go and be brave and do that too. Um, I have a saying that human authenticity will not leave you alone until you listen to it. Now, whether that's about gender or sexuality or whether it's about you being a writer or a musician or an actor or uh, a crafter or whatever, you know, a hiker, um, whatever, authenticity shows up in a whole lot of ways. And if you suppress it, if you have this thing inside you saying you need to do this in order to feel whole – and if you suppress it, you're like, no, 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 no. I'm not going to do it. Mom and Dad said I have to be an accountant. I can't be a, I can't be an artist, or I can't go and be an actor. They've told me I have to be an accountant. Well, you know that person may go on and go become an accountant, but they'll be miserable because their psyche, their gut, their heart will tell them, no, you need to be on the stage. Mm-hmm. You know, and some people get brave, and listen to this authenticity even later in life and and they pivot. Some people don't and they lay on their deathbeds. I mean, there was a study, oh, we're talking 15, maybe even more years um, that a hospice nurse in England did did a story that said the top five regrets of the death, you know, of the dying. And the regret number one was um, I didn't live a more authentic life. So this isn't just about LGBTQ people. It's about all humans, mm-hmm. you know, that we, we suppress our authenticity. We don't feel whole. We feel less than whole. And that creates all kinds of problems for us. Mm-hmm. It really does. Well, I, I spent many years <clears throat> being an inauthentic person. And I can't tell you, Ellie, how many people I hurt Girls, for example, like I, I wanted to fit in, so I just said, well, you know, maybe I should, you know, everybody's trying to push me to date girls, maybe, you know, and how many hearts I broke because, you know, you, 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 they start to like you and, you yeah. know, and they, and they get attached and then you just dump them because you know deep inside that's not you. 
and you're hurting these people yeah, yeah. And, 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 and in many other ways, you know, just lying about yourself all the time. I just yeah. had enough of it. And I, I finally going to college woke me up, Hunter College in, 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 in Manhattan. <laughs> Well you're, well, you're lucky to, to have the gotten mo- – Yeah, the most liberal <laughs> college. Well, you're lucky to have gotten it figured out that early. I mean, you know, I didn't – I mean, I broke I broke the heart of the person I loved the most in the whole wide world, my soulmate, my, my – at, at that point, my wife, you know, and I broke the hearts of uh, two daughters, one of whom I lost, and, and – but she came back when we're all good. But I – and I broke the heart of my sister who I lost, but she came back, thankfully, you know, but yeah, you're right. And um, um, I just, I, I mean, all of this is about surviving the human condition. Uh, you know, we, we all have a variety of different challenges. Yes. But I had to learn, I mean, I really do believe human authenticity will not leave you alone until you listen to it. Absolutely. My, it, mother, my mother used to say to me, it's not who you, you lost, it's who came back. Mm, that was very sweet. You know, because I did lose people. But then some, like you said, yep. came back. Yep. And yep. I lost friends at the beginning when I, when I finally said, well, the hell with this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, shout it from the highest mountaintop and say, this is me. And, mm-hmm. you know, and, you know, I did lose some people along the way. But there were people that came back. Right. And though, and that that's what mattered to me that that they th- they th- they mulled it over in their brain and they said, you know what, Philip's a nice guy, you know, he's not any different than he was before he told me, and they and they felt that they lost a good friendship. Yep. So yeah, all right. Well, um, now let's talk about your book. Okay, okay. this is this is a, a very interesting book. Uh, it's called Getting to Ellen. Which is your real name, right? Yep. Yes. Yep. Getting to Ellen, a memoir about love, honesty, and gender change. And can you walk us through what led you to writing the book and how this book might help many of us in the LGBTQ plus community, including yours truly here? <laughs> well, so the you know, the book is a you know, so just for the record, Ellen is my legal name. It will the strib, no matter the fact that everybody calls me Ellie. I'm sure that when I go, the strib will do an there'll be an obituary in the strib, and they'll call me Ellen. Um, the book uh, is um, a memoir, and it's just essentially my story of a, of suppressing and and thinking and trying to do everything I could to stay a man because I really, really love my wife, and I did not want to lose her. I did not want to lose any of my either of my children, and I also didn't want to lose my law practice, which was very, very successful in Iowa. And I didn't want to, you know, lose the big house and all kinds of stuff. And so it's a story about. So the reader, I take them on a journey, okay, and they, the and and the memoir is what's called a braided memoir. So there are two stories in the memoir. One story is about my father who committed suicide um, in 1990 when I was 33 years old. I'm sorry. And so, and so it's the story of about his suicide and the aftermath of having to deal with that suicide and its effect on me and my family. And then the other, but my father was also an alcoholic and that came into play about, uh, that affected me even to this day. And, um, and so, but the other story is about, you know, me, grappling with my gender identity and finally coming to a moment where I had a moment of truth and realized um, that unless I listened to this thing inside me, unless I listened to my authenticity, that I would lay on my deathbed and think of myself as a coward. I'd have all the love in the world, no doubt, and I'd probably be a millionaire several times over by the time I got there to my deathbed. But I, I, I was very clear on one night, which happened to be the night of 9-11. It became very, very clear to me that none of that would matter. None of that love, none of that money, none of that would matter. The only thing that would matter to me on my deathbed was that I knew that I was somebody else and I hadn't been brave enough to live my life as me. Whatever that me, you know, it's still pretty fuzzy what me was going to be. Um, and I just, that was just too unacceptable for me. And so the book details that moment of truth and then, you know, the subsequent me coming out and finally getting to be me and live as Ellie Krug with, you know, I mean, right now your listeners are, 
thinking that I'm probably about six foot four with a frame of, you know, 250 pounds. And the reality is, you know, because of this voice, the reality is I'm about five foot eight, <laughs> you know, size, yeah. size of four to six uh, dress, depending on the store, you know, but nobody, you know. Well, so. you know, it's, it's what captivates <clears throat> me about you. And I think it's because it's my person. It sounds like you're, you're speaking my personal journey. I, I lost my dad. He, he died, was actually murdered. Oh, my God. Um, oh, yeah, Philip, came, I'm so sorry. Came, came home. The cops came to the door. And I was four and a half years old. And oh my God. I'm sorry, you know, uh, ma'am, but you're, you're, we found your husband and got shot in the head and one bullet and he was dead. Um, so I grew up without a father. Oh, and then the alcoholism came later because my mother remarried an alcoholic who mm. was abusive. Okay. So my self-esteem was down the down the mm. tubes because he just – first of all, he, he saw I was a gay little boy, you know, and, and um, that wasn't – didn't match his image. Does that make sense? Sure. Like he wanted to send me to the baseball field and I wanted to stay home and play house with the girls, you know. So it it, it was tough. And when I and, and when I hear your stories, it, it kind of like I feel like and we're from the same part of the world, you know, in the East Coast. Um, it's fascinating. I have to definitely. I, I skimmed. I have to, you know, full disclosure. I skimmed through the book quickly oh, before the interview. But I want to worry about it. <laughs> I am going to read that book again, and um, because it's so pertinent to everybody that had that journey. You know, and um, well, we should let everybody know the book's available on Amazon, Kindle, or Nook, or your local bookstore will order. Yeah, getting to Ellen, <laughs> exactly. Yep, and I'll, and, and I'll repeat the, the the book's name again yeah, at the sure, end of the sure. show. And I think yeah. we have a link, kind of right. Every show has they they put little links next to where the, we can get the book I don't and know. stuff. Yeah. Okay. All right. So. Um, as most LGBTQ Minnesotans know, Lavender Magazine is the preeminent publication for our community. And can you talk about your column, Skirting the Issues, which received a gold medal award for excellence from the Minnesota Magazine and Publishing Association in 2013? Now, I read uh, Lavender ever since I moved to Minnesota, and I remember reading your column. Um, so could you tell a little, talk about that just very briefly, if you can? Yeah, so I started writing for Lavender in um, 2012, I believe, uh, and um, they had had a transgender writer, but uh, well, they had a couple. One who was really didn't write about anything that was transgender related, and the other, I I, I don't exactly know what the whole story was, but <clears throat> I wanted to write about what it meant to skirting the issues. The title is about what it meant to live life as a trans woman who doesn't pass because this voice doesn't match the appearance. And, um, you know, and the column was, you know, monthly and it was filled with a lot of stories. Uh, my, my, you know, one of my favorites was a, a, a column I published in, I think, December of 2018 titled Hope about an experience I had in San Francisco where one of my trainings had caused somebody to really believe that maybe our country could get past its divisions. But I will tell you, I don't write for Lavender anymore. Um, mm -hmm. They um, they became uh, upset. Uh, that would be the right word. Um, because my columns were, quote-unquote, too political and had become, quote-unquote, too political. Now, what I was doing was writing about the need to protect our young LGBTQ plus youth. And I was writing about how um, getting how those protections were becoming far more difficult, especially outside of Minnesota. And so the publisher, I think, was afraid that. Uh, and and then uh, two of my columns showed up in a conservative blog, um, uh, quoting my columns, um, a conservative blog that did a story about the fact that the Minnesota National Guard had, you know, a contract with Lavender for seventy or $80,000 worth of ads to recruit LGBTQ soldiers. But this conservative blog was criticizing the National Guard for having that kind of a contract. And they used me as an example of, of how outlandish uh, Lavender magazine was. So it came the time where I was forbade, forbidden from writing anything quote-unquote political. And I was told that Lavender Magazine is just a lifestyle magazine. It's not a 
political magazine. And my view is, if you're LGBTQ in America right now, I think it's a little hard not to be political. Um, so I resigned from Lavender. I would note for the record yes, um, that in the most recent election that we had, gubernatorial election, yes, uh, that Lavender, even though Lavender Magazine did not want to be political, that the back cover of Lavender Magazine, at least on one issue, if not more, was a full-page ad by the Republican candidate for governor. Full-page ad. He, in Lavender Magazine? In the back page of Lavender, he and his uh, running mate, who were not particularly LGBTQ-friendly people. Oh, my goodness. Um, Lavender Magazine carried that. This magazine that did not want to be political. So, Wow. Um, I'm... That's you're shocking me now because okay, I didn't, well, well I didn't think that was the case. I I would go uh, go online and see if you can grab the the issues from uh, oh my goodness October or November. I I don't know if it was more than one issue. I know it was certainly one because I saw it. <laughs> you know. Well, you're and, right about the. Uh, if I may, if I may add something, you're right about the, the you know the fluff that lavender is more like uh, you know like you said. Oh, this club is having this drag show and this club is doing that yeah. and and it's really not about um, the, the crisis, and that's the word I like to use, uh, uh, when it comes to our community. I mean, they're, sh- yeah. they're shooting up clubs, you know, drag yeah. shows, and I, I, yeah. I don't know how you could call that political if people are dying and people are being hurt by this. So I and, don't know. And, and, but. and young LGBTQ kids are killing themselves, you know, and uh, right. because of oppression and marginalization and bullying and all of right. that stuff. At any rate, so my relationship with Lavender ended. I resigned. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I wish them luck um, as a, you know, lifestyle and leisure magazine. It's like like People magazine for gays, I guess, right? Apparently. Yeah, yeah. Oh, geez. Except when when candidates come in with money to, you know, have their political ads. Right, right. (laughs) Oh, geez. Well, if I would have known that, I probably would have brought it up. Um, so before we get to the shift, and I think you've listened to the show before. I have a part of the show where I shift the questioning to current events. Yeah, um, sure. uh, would you like to share one or two of your favorite interviews uh, that you've conducted, whether on um, Iowa Public Radio, NPR, LE 2.0 Radio, that impacted you so profoundly that you'd like to share it with our listeners? Oh, geez. I wish you had told me about this coming in. Um, you know um, – well, uh, because I, I I don't remember all the names, unfortunately. Um, we one, can talk about uh, the the I, issue that well, came up. Well, I had uh, her. Her name was Donna, Dana, D A N N A. I think it was Dana Nelson. Um, uh, it was an interview I did last year. She was dying of cancer. She, uh, she was in her mid thirties. She had been dealing with cancer for a number of years, um, and uh, she had become an advocate for. Um, End of life, medically assisted end of life, and uh, and I'm a proponent of that as well. I I don't believe that people should ever. I think people should have the ability to control when they turn the lights out. And and I will, but she was so um, just so magnificent. I think that would be the right word throughout the interview. Um. So, um, you know, persevering, not bitter, um, wise, um, and, and I had asked her, um, what was her favorite song? And it was a song by, um, Tame Impala, and I'm not recalling the name of the song, but, but as she said that, I pointed to, uh, Brett Johnson, our wonderful producer, and he found the song. And we played that as an outtake at the end of the interview. Mm. And, um, but I got done with that interview and I just start, started sobbing. I could not, I could not stop crying. I was sobbing. And actually a lot of your interviews, you, you've become very emotional. Yeah. You get, you, you always bring me to tears too. Well, when I listen to your well, interviews. I think sometimes it's like, you know, I, I've got to be you're a little, very, bit, you're a little em- bit stronger than... You're an empathetic person, well, and that's nothing wrong with that. But that interview, I mean, you, ma- you asked, you know, that interview was... Yes. 
and then she she died um she died um within the last uh two or three months <clears throat> she died and i i talked about it and we played the the tame impala song again for her oh so you know i do get emotional um and 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 it's <clears throat> You know, and it's probably highly unprofessional, um, but no, it's it's don't say just that. you know, no. it's just um, it's human. You no, always talk about being a human, right? It, it is, and yeah. um, <clears throat> you know, I just, I mean, I am incredibly lucky to have this show. I'm incredibly lucky to, you know, I still write for Minnesota Women's Press. I'm incredibly lucky. You know, to have a newsletter that goes out a mo- once a month to nine thousand people, right? And they, you know, and, I mean, the open rate on the newsletter is approaching fifty percent, which is just kind of unbelievable for uh-huh. for any kind of a mass mailing, right? Right. And you know, and then I get to do the work where I get to stand in front of people and talk, and I know that I'm incredibly, incredibly lucky um, to to get to do that, and mm-hmm. um, and I it, sometimes it's just overwhelming the gratitude that i have over but at the same time it i it's always a feeling it's never enough that there's so much more to do and there is you know and yeah. that and that if only this or that could happen maybe instead of sp- standing and speaking to 20 people maybe i'd be speaking to a thousand people and it's not about aggrandizement whatsoever it's not about like oh my god the great ellie krug no not at all it's about the work it's about the words, because I do believe, you know, all of those those countless hours I spent in courtrooms learning how to be a lawyer, and trust me, there were a lot of mistakes I made in the courtroom, trust me, but, but all of that gave me the tools to be able to connect with humans. You know, effective lawyering, that's all it is, is just being able to convince a, a jury that what you're saying is true, and... And the work that I do is pretty easy because it is all true. We mm-hmm. are all attempting to survive the human condition. We all do need to have greater compassion for others and ourselves. Okay, all right, I'll stop. What, what next do you have here? <laughs> no, I, 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 again, uh, you're a very empathetic person. Uh, I, I admire you. Thanks. I wish many more people – I mean, talk show hosts have to have some – I mean, how could you be a talk show host and not feel <coughs> for the guest that's going through such a horrible thing? I mean, I full disclosure, I don't know if you know, I, I, I'm going through my own cancer uh, uh, journey as well. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it, I did it not It came know that. back. Um, but I'm, but as, the, as the, um, the listeners know, I'm, I'm, my prognosis is very good because they caught it early. Good. I did the radiation. I did the whole thing. Okay. And, uh, you know, I have the side effects here and there, but, but uh, I'm – there are people that are not as lu- not as lucky as I am, and um, and I I pray for them all the time, and I pray for their families because it takes a lot of strength to yep. go through that. Anyway, um, so now we come to the uh, part of the show I like to call the shift, where I shift the questioning away from your career, which is an amazing career, and on to um, current events. How's that? Is that sure? Will that work out? Okay, we have a few more minutes here, so let's let's work on some of these current event issues. As you know, this is Black History Month, yep. and we are hearing more and more about certain politicians trying to prevent the teaching of AP Ameri- uh, African American Studies, the Black LGBTQ plus struggle, and their attempts to diminish the blemish that slavery was on this country. Can you share some of your thoughts about this and your feelings? I wouldn't call slavery a blemish. I would call it a gaping wound. Um, yeah, a hole. Yeah, gaping. Um, well, the. I mean, I think that. I think that um, we have to understand that the country continues to operate from a dynamic where white color people, I refer to white people as white color, C-O-L-O-R, because most white people don't believe that their skin color is a color. They think it's normal or base. That where, you know, the white skin color has historically been dominant, it continues to historically, it continues to be dominant. And that, um, and that people are, who are in power, 
um, are not willing to share that power democratically. They're not willing to relinquish it. They're not willing to invite others to the table, even though it's a big table. They want to have all the seats at the table for themselves and, and their group. Mm-hmm. You know, and so I think that this is this is continues to be a problem. And the fact that, for example, in Florida, they don't want you making children uncomfortable. That's the legal standard. They don't want children to become uncomfortable by talking about our history. Um, it, it's you know, it it's just it, it it's just horrible. And um, we have to push back against it. We really do. I mean. Uh, and, and, you know, black people need to have white allies. And not that, you know, I'm a savior or anything like that, but, I mean, they need to have people who have power. And you and I, you both have, you have white skin, I've got white skin. We have power just mm-hmm. by virtue of the skin color. Now, that doesn't make white people racist. It doesn't make, it, it, it just means that we don't understand, you know, the, the historical ramifications of having enslaved a group of humans for you know, 264 years in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and you know, and then Jim Crow following for another 100 years. Yeah, and history has, has not been <clears throat> kind to uh, Native Americans either. Mm-hmm. I mean, but history can't be always, you know, lollipops and rainbows. You have to teach what really happened. You do. And I don't understand why a parent would be a would object to their child learning, well, this is really what happened to the Native Americans. Yeah. This is what really happened to our African-American brothers and sisters. This, you know, this is history. Well, this is where we get into this thing about indoctrination and wokeism and all of that. And, oh, please. I hate that <coughs> word. I don't like that you know, word. It's but, ridiculous. Right. But, I mean, I think that, and you know, and, and it's the, you know, I mean, you and I growing up, we didn't have to contend with Fox News. That's and, there, true. and there, and there yep. wasn't an MSNBC. There was Walter Cronkite, mm-hmm. you know, Peter, mm-hmm. you know, Peter Jennings. The fairness doctrine was in place at that time. Huntley, Huntley Brinkley, you know, I mean, here are the news, you know, here are the facts. Barbara Walters. Every once in a while they do an opinion, but it wasn't like railing it, a group uh-huh. of humans. And so um, – There was the McLaughlin report. That was like the, where there, there, there was the left and the right. Remember that show? Yeah, uh, yeah. That was the only one I could think of that was like point counterpoint kind of thing, you know. But even that was respectful. I mean, yeah, they, weren't very. Calling, they weren't calling each other names. Oh God, yeah. You uh-huh. know, but I mean, the you know hatred sells, and uh, you know the those who are intolerant uh, who lead uh, have realized that, and and you know um, it, it's. But but when we can get people away from all of that and we just get people in a room to talk to each other, they realize that everybody's just pretty much like each other. I mean, we all have our challenges, but but the the question is getting them in the room. Mm-hmm. The question is getting Ellie Krug to stand in front of audiences to say, yeah, this voice doesn't match the appearance, but I want the same things in life that you do. I want my children to succeed. I want to love and be loved. I want to be free of physical or emotional violence and I want 20 minutes apiece just like you do. Yeah. So. Yes. But see, again, you and I are em- empathetic people. We understand the plight of other people. We don't look just very insularly, if that's a word, insularly? Is that a word? I don't know. I, okay. I made up my own word. Um, we don't look into ourselves and say, well, it's all about me and what, it, what else is happening in the world doesn't concern me. So it, I'm not going to vote on that issue, which to me is – is um, b- being in America, especially in a, such a melting pot, we have to be able to see each other's issues right. and be able to, to understand each other and speak as – like two <clears throat> people would normally speak to each other with, with, with respect. And that's, that's where we need to go. Yep. Um, now I was going to talk about the um, you know the bills that were going on with uh, uh, you know uh, signing a slew of bills looking at uh, to restrict and prohibit drag shows uh, from even existing. Yeah. Uh, there's also drag show um, uh, excuse me drag story hour yep. where they where they and have libraries. drag queens yep. yeah uh, have a book and they and it's a children's book it's not going to be you know they're not reading you know Deep Throat you know uh, they're reading a regular book. And, you know, a Dr. Seuss book, for example. Why is that t- – t- t- again, I know this is, this is like repeating a, – beating a dead horse. But why do you think this is such a horrible thing for some of these people? Um, 
Well, you know, because of what the intolerant leaders are saying that, you know, this is grooming, that this, I mean, these are phrases that never even existed before, you know, grooming, that they're indoctrinating children, you know, and, and I mean, there's this whole push. I mean, there's a whole push to remove, you know, books from libraries that have anything to do other than with, you know, I mean, I, I read yesterday that, you know, Roberto Clemente's book they want to remove from the Really? Library in Florida, yeah. Why because, is that? He was a baseball player. Yeah, well, but he writes a little bit about racism in baseball growing up. Oh. You know, my God, God there forbid. There you go. God, God forbid, forbid you talk about that. You hear about, about that. about Jackie Robinson's book? Then? They must have got rid of Who that knows? too. Who knows? You know, I mean, um, and so, I, I, you know, this is all a pushback. And what, um, will it blow over? Um, yeah, assuming our country stays together. You know, yep. that's the big question. Exactly. That's you why know? I keep bringing up this ally thing. Yeah. You know, we need to keep uh, everybody that's feeling marginalized or even those who are allies just that understand it, stick together and vote appropriately. You know, we have to get these people out, you know. I mean, I remember um, – this is another tangerine I'm going on. I'm a flight attendant, as you know. Um I had Mudcat Grant on a flight. He's he was the first African American pitcher for the Minnesota Twins. Okay, and he came on the plane in in his regalia, you know, and uh, he told me how terrible he was treated at first uh, when he came into the major leagues because at, at that time they were transitioning into uh, black uh, players into the uh, major leagues. And he had tears in his eyes, and mm. I'll never forget that. Yep. You know, this is a human being who was a very good pitcher. He was a first, I think he was actually the first twenty game pit, uh, uh, winner for the Twins, um, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong. Okay. Not, yep. Sports is not my yeah. thing. But, Mine neither. Um, but uh, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so um, I've added a question to all my shows now because now we're moving into the political uh you know the elections coming up next year and now the primaries will be you know imminent um i always wanted to know you know pick the brain of the person sitting across from me what do you think about um who would be the um nominee for the republican party and who do you think would be the nominee for the Democratic Party and why? So, if you would, you were to yeah. have a crystal ball and be able to, or you have no I idea. I don't. Does. You know, I don't know. I mean, <clears throat> a lot can happen between now and um, and next spring, and a lot can happen between next spring and next fall. I, I you know, I don't know. I, and sorry, but I, I'm not. I'm not going to procast pro. Cross, whatever the word is, uh, <laughs> prognosticate, prognosticate, prognosticate yeah, yeah, yeah. about about it. I just not. Yeah, you know. I've had so many different answers. Yeah. You know, I've had somebody just recently, one of the shows, say Mike Pence because they think he's the only one that looked like he would uh, uh, be calm on the stage because everybody's kind of like you know uh, batshit crazy on that. You know, I don't know, but uh, yeah, all right. Um, uh, what are, what are your thoughts about how President Biden did a rope a dope and got the Republicans to agree to keep their hands off Social Security yeah. and Medicare at the State of the Union? And I you, thought he was pretty good when he did that. Wasn't that a, yeah. that was so ingenious? I mean, he was literally saying, you know, oh, hey, you know what? And everybody's going, no, that you know, scoffing and making faces, and and the next thing you know, he goes, oh, so we all we all agree here. That yeah. you you want to preserve it, yeah. and and he got them to admit it. So yeah, the, and on the way here, I, I heard that Rick Scott has put out a new um, statement saying he never intended for Medicare or, or um, Social Security to be on under review. So yeah, but that's not true. But I, actually, yeah, there's a lot of no. Uh, of course, it's there's not true. also that other senator um, from Utah, Senator Mike Lee, I believe his name is. They literally have him on. On video, yeah. saying that I want to pull it up, Social Security up by its roots. Yeah, you know. So <clears throat> no, that's, you know, and these are people who are you know are millionaires and they they don't need to worry about money. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. they have no idea what it. I mean, many of our elected people have no idea what it means to be, you know, scraping by. So, so before we end the show. Uh, is there any particular political story that I haven't mentioned, or any issue that I haven't mentioned that um, I, you know, that you would like to bring up before we close out? 
No, you know, I mean, you, you're a very good interviewer, Philip. So I I'm oh, just, thank you, you know, you're very, very thorough. Um, no, I just appreciate the opportunity to be on your show. Oh my and goodness! Thanks. And I, 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 again, this is going to sound like I'm I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm not uh, being honest here, but I am so honored that you came because I, I, like I said, I've been listening to your show for a really long time, and it's not only inspiring, but it it makes I, I know if it makes me cry and makes me think. And you get one person just to think, like, yep. this is a person. This is a human being. And I like when you say humans, you know. Can you do that one time? Just like when you do that. What Could you do it once for our listeners again? <laughs> humans. Hello, <laughs> humans. <laughs> That's it. LE 2.0 Radio. <laughs> so, uh, unfortunately, we've come to the end of the show. Um, for more information about Ellie Krug, who I uh, adore, I, I hope we get to see each other again, not only just in the hallway, but <laughs> more down the road. I'm sure the the elections coming up will be doing some some work on sure, that. Sure. Uh, you can follow her on Twitter at Ellie Krug and listen to our show, Ellie 2.0 Radio, here at AM 950. And again, would like to thank you for coming to the Downright Upright Show. This is a very new show. It only started in May, and I'm starting to get like amazing people coming on the show. I'm just, oh, I'm, just I'm not worthy. <laughs> that's great. Good for you. And uh, to our listeners, thank you for spending time with us today. And please stay tuned for more of the Downright Upright Show in the near future. This is your host, Philip Anthony, saying ciao for now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>